Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's go ahead and jump in here. We finished with um, Colossians last week. Now we're going to jump into uh, what now begins. Now, this is, the la- this is the last of the prison epistles or letters. Paul, you know, uh, remember he, a lot of his stuff was written while he was traveling, and then he got, he got in prison, and he wrote um, Ephesians, um, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon in the first imprisonment. And then after we finish Philemon, we'll move into Titus and first and second Timothy, which he wrote during his second imprisonment. That'll be the last, that'll be it. The next three letters after this is, will be the end of, of Paul's teachings and writings. We are moving into now what we refer to as the personal epistle. Okay, so we, we are, you know, in some in Timothy's case, uh, pastoral epistles, but these are personal letters. They're not letters to the church in general. Okay, we glean great wisdom from them, but they were written uh, on a personal level. And so here we have Philemon. Now Philemon's letter is written. Um, the primary purpose of this letter was written to his friend Philemon, or our fellow servant in the gospel, uh, because Onesimus. Had, had, was a runaway slave, had stolen from him and ran away. Apparently somewhere in there, Paul met him. He got born again and became a, became a faithful servant to Paul in the gospel. Now Paul is writing this letter back to Philemon as he sends Onesimus back in order to restore him and, um, you know, clear his debt. He could have been killed for what he did. Okay? So uh, here we go. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer. Now notice Paul did not say an apostle of Jesus Christ because Paul was not writing this letter to use his, his apostolic authority uh, to get what he desired out of this situation. He was, he was um, moving in a different direction on a much more personal and intimate method saying a prisoner of Jesus Christ. In other words, I am in prison for the sake of the gospel. Hallelujah to Philemon. And so he chose to use that and um, there was a uh, definite article in front of, um, of uh, who, who was it here? Uh, Timothy, our brother. And the definite article means he's the brother. In other words, Timothy was a, a well-known and important part of the church hierarchy as far as uh, ministry and so forth during that time. He called Philemon a dearly, uh, a dearly beloved and fellow laborer. So the tone of Paul's letter starts out in a very uh, affectionate, Christian affection, you understand, affectionate and tender and a non-authoritarian uh, position, okay? Notice the tone changes when it's on a personal level versus the general level. When Paul wrote on general levels, he did um, uh, m- just about all the time re- um, defer to his authority and apostleship. Here on a personal level, see, now, uh, people don't understand that a lot of times when you're doing things on a personal level, you do it differently than you do on a general level, uh, and that's just, that's just the way it is. You just deal with things on different ways. Hallelujah. Okay. <clears throat> so he goes on and says, And to our beloved Aphia and Ar- Archippus, our fellow soldier, uh, and to the church in thy house. In other words, these, uh, these two people were probably co-laborers, maybe even apostle, I mean, uh, pastors or um, uh, leaders there in that area, and Paul was just greeting them also. Grace to you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is the Greek greeting. Peace is the Hebrew greeting. And uh, Paul gives, gives the, um, this combination, which he does, grace and peace be unto you. <clears throat> because grace occupies the, um, the emphatic position here in this statement. It definitely points to the necessity of depending upon grace in our Christian lives. That peace or inner tranquility follows the reception of God's grace. You have peace because you've, rec- you've received the grace of God. Okay, hallelujah. They come from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, so forth. Now, in going down to verse 4, I thank my God that making mention of you always in my prayers. Hallelujah. The word I thank comes from Eucharisto, uh, which is where we get the English word or the word Eucharist, which is also many times referred to as the communion. And Paul is saying here that um, our, our source comes from Christ. <clears throat> the, the communion of God doesn't just, it's not a ritualistic thing. We come up, you know, and we have the, you know, the wine becomes the blood of Jesus and the bread becomes his body and we, we're actually partaking of Christ and it becomes a ritual. Now, I don't believe that. I don't believe that it literally happens. I, that's, 
That is, uh, that's the church at Rome that says that. I don't believe it. I don't accept it as biblical premise. It's a typology. Jesus, Jesus' blood is represented by the grape juice. Hello, the bread represents his body. I do not believe it literally becomes his body and blood. I don't believe he has Bible. As, as some people refer to that as transmutation. Um, I don't believe it's a biblical. Oh, wow, because I believe his blood's on the mercy seat. Okay, we, we drink together. Hallelujah. At the, at the last Passover, his, that, that body, that, that bread didn't become his body, and that grape juice did not become his blood. Okay? All right? But they are, you know, Paul's saying that his fellowship or his communion with Christ is really, it starts out with thankfulness and, and honoring and thanking God. We need to be a, have a thankful heart towards God. We need to have a grateful heart towards God. Don't need to just come in and go, well, it's time for communion. And I repent for all the sins I've done. Hallelujah, glory to God. Drink, eat. Boom, I'm taking care of it. I'm going out the door to which you hadn't lived. It's a ritual. When it, when, you, when it becomes a ritual, it loses its meaning. Okay? We don't do things ritualistically. We do them out of a communion with God. Okay? And this Eucharisto, I think. Thanksgiving. Now, remember, Bob tells us that the, the, the victory that we gain through Jesus Christ calls us to, through us thanksgiving to God. So we have to have a thankful heart. Can somebody shout glory? glory. Say, I thank, say, I, say, I got a thankful heart. Okay. So he says, I thank my God, are you Christo? Uh, I, have a, I have a fellowship. Amen? My, my thanksgiving with God creates a fellowship with God. And I thank him, making mention of you, Philemon, in, always in my prayers. Oh, he, th he thanks, he puts Philemon before the throne of God, gives thanks for him. Amen? Okay. Hearing of thy love and thy faith, glory to God, that thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Now, here, agape, I had your love. Now, <coughs> Paul was able to pray for Philemon and all people all the time because of, his love, because of love and faith. And here, in this particular case, Philemon's love and faith is testified of. Okay? And they do go hand in hand. Um, he had his love and his faith towards God, or the Lord Jesus, and towards the saints. Now, here is something that is so, is so subtle, we, all, we, can, we can miss it. There is a vertical love and faith that corresponds with the horizontal love and faith. In other words, our love and faith, our love for, and our faith toward God enables us to have a love for and faith for men. So the vertical I mean, relationship enables or empowers us for the horizontal. Okay? Remember the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Vertical comes before the horizontal. You are not empowered to love your neighbor as yourself until you are walking in love with the Father. Okay, that's where it comes from. So we, we start first with our love toward the Father, our faith toward God, and that empowers us to have a love towards our fellow man, and to, in, in some in cases, faith for them. Okay, or faith in, in their abilities to serve God, etc. So we have a vertical, horizontal statement here. I've heard of your agape and your faith, and it says, first of all, what? Towards the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Notice that the Lord Jesus does come first, always will come first, because you're void of the power, you're void of its ability to be effective if he's not first. You're going to have, you know, we get people who go to churches because they love people, but they don't have a love for God. You, that doesn't work. That's not, that's not God. That's not the way. And then because, there's, you know, that person does something, the other person will follow them. Your love for God and your faith toward God should supersede any vertical or be horizontal relationship. And the horizontal relationship should be birthed out of the vertical one. And it's, and that's so what? The vertical one sets the standard for it. Amen. The vertical relationship sets the standard for the horizontal. So it doesn't mean that, you, you, know, you, you know, you love God, you have faith toward God, but, you, you, know, you know, God's not doing some of the stuff that the horizontal stuff's doing. Okay? Not doing a whole lot of stuff that the horizontal's doing. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, he sees this. Paul sees this in Philemon. So, so you can kind of say it this way. Paul's buttering Philemon up. Because he's coming to something eventually here. 
All right? But he's, what he's doing, they have a relationship. They have a pre-existing relationship. And so what Paul is doing, Paul is appealing to the spiritual side of Philemon, the, the love side of Philemon, the God-serving side of Philemon, saying you have a vertical relationship with God. He's getting ready to get to a horizontal relationship where he wants to implement how the vertical works in relation to man. Okay? And uh, so he says here that the communication, that is koinonia, that is fellowship, okay, are partaking together of thy faith. In other words, you know, when you have, you can have koinonia in minutes, you have partners. Really work can be, you know, sometimes we translate this word koinonia as partners. That the partnership of your faith, in other words, he's got a partnership of faith, may become effectual to the acknowledging epinosis. Is, the root here is epinosis. It's a different form of it. But if the root is epinosis, the clear, precise, actual, uh, experiential knowledge of God. I might, become, might become effectual by the clear, precise, and accurate and experiential knowledge of every good thing which is in you, Christ, in Christ Jesus. All good things that we have. So what he's saying here is that their fellowship of, of faith... Paul had it, Philemon had it, okay? Uh, he, he, he equates other people in there, and eventually he'll put, bring Onesimus into this. That, that fellowship of faith, hallelujah, brings a realization of the accurate and concise knowledge of the good things Jesus does in people and in, your, in, the, in the people who are in the partnership together. I feel like, you know, I think some Lord of the Rings people out here, so I can say the fellowship of the ring or whatever. <laughs> you know, the fellowship of the faith, hallelujah. Glory to God. Return of the king. All right. So, he, he, he makes this statement here. He's talking about that, he, you know, he wants, that his love, that your love for God, your faith toward God becomes more real as you see God, as, as you walk in that faith and in that vertical and now it becomes horizontal <coughs> and you see the good things God's doing in people. <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> it brings you to a deeper knowledge of the love of God, which is what Saturday is all about. We're going to go out because we love God and have faith toward God and share that with other people and see him work in people's lives and minister to other people's lives. And it'll bring us into a deeper understanding of the love and care of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Excuse me. Is this certified? Certified. CAF water, certified amoeba free. Hallelujah. I like that. Hallelujah. See, Philemon had been sharing his faith. Paul said, you know, yeah, I would that because of the fellowship of, or the corner of the partnership or the fellowship of your faith, you have come to understand, have a deeper knowledge, have a clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of every good thing that Christ Jesus does in people, and even in you. you and that, actually, as you see it in other people, you have a deeper understanding of what he's done in you. As you see what God is doing in other people's lives, it gives you a, a deeper revelation of what he's done in yours. Hallelujah. So we want to, we want, so Paul says, that's what I want for you. I want you to have this, you know, that, that, be, that, that very fellowship, the koinonia, the partnership, the fellowship, the communion of this faith. Now you come to a deeper knowledge of what the good things that Christ Jesus does in and for people and even in yourself. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 7, for we have great joy and consolation in that love. Oh, I'm telling you when, you, when you see uh, the fruit of your investment in the hearts of other men and women, when you see what God does in other men and women because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you see what God's working in other people's lives, it, and you have a part in that. I'm telling you something about leading someone to the Lord or, or ministering to somebody and seeing the transformation take place in their life, and then it goes out and you begin to see it work in their life. It brings consolation and joy to your own heart. Amen. Praise God. Or can you say glory? glory? And on the same hand, it brings heartache and pain when you see people who you did have those things happen with turn their life and reject Christ and curse the blood of Jesus. And I mean, it, it just, it's heartbreaking. So, we, we want to make sure we keep ministering life to people so they keep bringing joy and consolation to us. Amen? Um, we, we have great joy and consolation of thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Now, the word bowels actually means what you think, the, the bowels. But it was used in this time um, 
in an allegorical method or sense to refer to uh, the innermost being. Sometimes translators would use the heart. That just didn't carry it. The deepest, most inner meaning part of you, you know, with the bowels. In other words, he's using that terminology in this sense, and it carries that thought. With it. It doesn't, you're not talking about your intestines. Okay? I mean, that, literally that's what it means. But that's, not the, that's not what he's trying to say. He's talking about the innermost being. You know, that your love, that you know, your, you know the consolation and joy because of your love, that it, 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 because that love that you have, uh, um, because the bowels of the saints are what? Refreshed by you, brother. We're getting great joy and great consolation because the, the, the innermost beings of saints are being refreshed by what you do. So Paul's telling Philemon, you know, you're, you're, you've been very special. You're special to people. You've been a blessing to people. Okay, so notice this, this tone of this letter is totally different than maybe what Galatians or Ephesians, Philippians or Colossians. You know, those are general letters. There was correction in there. There were statements of position. There were statements of correction. Lots of state. Actually, if you go, uh, if you read Paul's writings, and, and we've been doing for the past year and a half, year and nine months, I believe we're going to get done before January. Hallelujah. Two years. We'll have her done. Hallelujah. But um, Paul, when writing his general epistles, he, did you know that the letters written to the churches were written some you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years after Jesus had ascended up into heaven? And so for some of that time, they, they were teaching Old Testament, and there was no, no clear-cut New Testament doctrine. You know, and Paul would begin to write letters now to bring correction or to bring balance or to bring doctrine out of the teachings, you know, they knew Jesus was the Son of God. They were confessing Jesus. They were getting baptized in Jesus' name. But, you know, there had to come revelation concerning New Testament doctrine. And so Paul would come back in and go, okay, now look, you, you know, these Judaizers have come in. You can't do this. This isn't, this isn't wholesome doctrine. Okay? And he would deal with things. He would deal with homosexuality. Or he would deal with adultery. He would deal with, you know, different sins. And, uh, and, they, were, and they had to be dealt with because they were error. Now you got people come along, they say, well, we, don't, we don't need the Bible, we don't need First John, we don't need this, we don't need that, you know, because we got love. Well, see, Paul corrected that stuff. You know, what did he say about grace? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Okay? Because, see, people were teaching some of that stuff. They were teaching those things. And he had, so letters were written in the general epistles. They were written to establish doctrine and bring correction. Now, if, you, if you can't believe that Paul brought correction, you haven't been reading your Bible. Or you've been listening to somebody who doesn't read their Bible. Now, if you're not reading your Bible and you're listening to somebody else who doesn't read their Bible, you're in deep trouble. Okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, you, you need to listen to those who are reading the Bible and studying out the whole context. Paul brought, so, but yet on his personal level, here we have a personal letter. And the tone and everything about the letter is completely different. Because he's making a personal appeal on a personal level for, uh, for certain things. Okay? And so he's very encouraging to Philemon. Hallelujah. Um, and so he says here, you know, uh, you, the, the, the bowels of the saints, or the innermost being of the saints are refreshed by the brother. You're my brother. And you're refreshing the people. See how, see how, how this letter is in, in difference in tone from his other uh, general epistles? Then he goes on to the next verse. And he says, wherefore, though I might be bold in Christ to enjoin that which is convenient. Can I tell you what he just said there in plain English? Okay, I could use my authoritarian apostleship to tell you what I want you to do. That's what he's saying here. Wherefore, I thought, you know, I might, um, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin you to that which is convenient. In other words, in other words Paul said, I could just tell you because of my apostleship, my authority to do what I want you to do. He says, but he goes on, look at the next verse. Yet for love's sake, what? They're, they're in partnership. Remember, they're in koinonia together. They're in communion. They're in partnership. They're in fellowship together in the gospel. I'd rather beseech you. I'd rather pray for you. I'd rather beg you. Being such as one as Paul the aged. He used the presbytery, which we get the word presbytery from here. But in this case, it means aged, old. That's his intent. He used it to mean old. And now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, look, I could use my authority, but we have a communion of fellowship. So instead of me telling you what you've got to do, I'm going to ask you. Okay? 
Now, I know pastors. I, I, was, I was in a meeting one time with a very, very, very well-known Old Assemblies of God minister. Um, what's Lester somewhere? He's gone on to be with the Lord. And, you know, and he did it publicly. So, I'm not, you know, he... he Somebody raised a hand during the, during the conference we were at and said, Brother Summerall, how do we, we can't get people to work in the nursery. How do you get people to work in the nursery? Real simple. You're in the nursery this week. You're in the nursery next week. You're in the nursery the week after. That's how I do it. That's authority and apostleship. Okay? But, you know, Brother Summerall really wasn't a pastor. He was, a, he was a, 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 an apostle and an, a, an evangelist. And so he just kind of traveled and he'd blow in, blow up, and blow out. Then he'd leave the, they'd leave it to his sons to pastor. <laughs> but he had no trouble getting, trouble getting his nursery filled. But I know a lot of pastors who run the churches that way. They just tell people, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And, um, and that's not my demeanor. You've probably figured it out over the years. I've never gone to anybody and say, you are going to do this on this particular day. We're almost apologetic. We would like for you to da 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 da, da. That's just, that's our, that's our nature, is to approach it more like Paul is. I'm asking you. You know, as a pastor, I could tell you I expect you to do it, and I want you in there next week. But we, we don't like to do that. Um, more of this particular method. Hallelujah, I'm more, I'm more inclined to go this way. Aren't you glad? Okay. Verse 9. Yet for love's sake, I'd rather pray or beg you, being a such one as Paul the aged. In other words, maybe saying, look, I've learned a few things over life. I can, I can do this now just by uh, asking you instead of, Telling you, hallelujah. Are you here? And also, and also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now he gets into the crux of the matter. In other words, what do they say? Uh, he let the other shoe drop. I beseech you the, I beseech you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now, now the word my son is really my child. I'm praying or I'm begging you on the behalf of my child. Who, who, he begotten him in bonds. Paul led him to the Lord. Anesimus, hallelujah. Uh, I'm, pr I'm I here. This letter is, now he actually sent it by Anesimus to Philemon. Remember, Anesimus had stolen from him and run away. Now he's sending him back with a letter, not to get killed in the middle of the battle like David did to Uriah, <laughs> but, you know, a, a letter of restoration and reconciliation. Which in time past was to the unprofitable. Well, if you've got a guy stealing from you and running away, he's not very profitable to you, is he? But now profitable to thee and to me. I'm sending him back different. Now remember, let's go back, go back. Paul's already introduced the, uh, the uh, theological perspe perspe uh, perspective of a vertical transcending and becoming horizontal. Our love for God becoming horizontal with man. He's talked about how that Philemon has, uh, he's refreshed the bowels, the innermost being of the saints by his acts of love and faith and kindness. <clears throat> that he is a fellow, uh, he's in fellowship with Paul in the ministry. Now, based on all that, and, and, and before I get into this, I could use my authority. But I'm going to use our relationship on this one, okay? Hallelujah. Verse 12, who I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. Now Paul says, I'm sending him back to you. And this is coming out of my inner, I mean, it's, this is like tearing my guts out. Remember, because he said he's, he's profitable to you and to me. Onesimus had become a true and tremendous blessing to Paul in serving him in ministry. And, you know, and Paul's sending him back. And Why? Who I would have retained. In other words, I wanted to keep him with me. With me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. In other words, that he could fulfill for me what you couldn't do because you're over there and I'm over here, but he was with me. And I wanted to keep him. But without thy mind, without your consent, would I, not, I do nothing. That thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. In other words, Paul wasn't going to write him a letter and say, look, he ran away. I got him. Got him saved. You forgive him. I'm keeping him. Not without his consent. Because he, he didn't want to do a relationship breaker. There's a lot of people who break relationships over things. He didn't want to have a relationship breaker here. So what did he do? He said, I'm sending him back to you. Because I can't retain him here with me. He's a blessing to me. But I don't, I, I don't, I could, 
But without your consent and without your whatever, um, you're just going to be a relationship breaker. And we don't want to really have relationship breakers in the gospel. As a matter of fact, by now, Paul already learned that lesson. Remember the, bar, the Mark went with him and didn't stay with him on the trip, came back. <clears throat> on the next trip, Barnabas wanted to take him. Paul said no. And the dissension between them got so great that they broke up. Paul took Timothy and Barnabas took Mark and they went separate ways. And it's not until later that Mark, that Paul writes and says, bring Mark for he's now profitable to me in the ministry. Mark was the nephew, we believe, of Barnabas. But we never hear Barnabas again after that event. Okay. Mark got his act together. But see, Paul, Paul learned the lesson of relationship breaking. So now instead of breaking relationship with someone he's in coin Neo with, he's, he's, he's asking for the permission. He's begging. He's praying. He's asking and appealing to their vertical relationship of love and faith to work at a horizontal plane. Okay? Hallelujah. Um, but without thy mind or without thy consent, would I do nothing that thou... That thy benefits should not be, as it were, of necessity. In other words, uh, he, he probably could have said, Hey, look, I'm Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. Onesimus came up here. I got him born again. I know he was your slave. He was your servant. He stole from me. Let me just tell you, he's got saved. It's all forgiven. And I'm keeping him. Deal with it, pal. Hello? I said, you know, deal with it. Well, that's not how it works. Had somebody come in a number of years ago and had somebody on our church staff and they, they pulled him outside. I think you'd be great for me in the ministry where I am. And he came to me and I said, I knew you wouldn't mind if I asked him to come join me in my ministry where I was. And I'm like, oh, well, I do mind. You know? Just because you think you have a greater need than I have doesn't mean it makes it, it, makes it right. You know? Right there in the, right here in the church. Well, that's not right. I said, that's not right. So Paul's Paul's saying, no, I could, and, and he could, he could, he was the chiefest of apostles. Although he said he was the least, he was really the chief. That's why he could be the chief, because he, he's considered himself the least. But without thy mind, I would do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, you were forced to do it, but willingly. In other words, if you give it willingly, then great. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. In other words, he, he, you, he left a thief and a runaway. He's come back a brother in the Lord. A faithful servant in the Lord. Amen? Now, not as, not now as a servant, but above a servant. Now, see, Paul's, going, now Paul's arguing the case. Don't bring him back and make him a slave. He's a brother in the Lord. A brother beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in flesh and in the Lord. Paul's saying, look, he's coming back, but don't, don't bring him back as a servant, a slave. Now, why didn't Paul deal with slavery at that issue? Because he knew, as we all should know, that getting men and women's hearts changed with the gospel of Jesus Christ is what breaks the bonds of evil ways of mankind. You can break the bonds of slavery by getting people born again and getting them to recognize a relationship. Remember, Paul did write one place. He said, you know, the servants, serve your masters not with eye service, but as unto the Lord. Servant masters, don't, don't treat them cruelly. And treat them as, you know, and then, you know, so he's love on them. You divide, and, and what happens is over time, you, you, rid the, you rid your culture of that mindset that it's okay. Because people are born again. They're walking in love one to another. No man should have demonic dominion over another man. And God takes care of it. And you don't have to kill half a million people to do it. Hello. I said, hello, God can get things done without having a war. Sometimes, I know sometimes you got to fight, but our, our nature had a, had what well, they call it a civil war, but it was really a war between, the, between two sets of states. Go study your history. The Union and the Confederate States of America, they were two separate nations at the time they went to war. So you call it, you call it a civil union if you want to, but they were actually had their own constitution in the South. So it was, two, it was a war between two nations. All right? And we killed, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of men, young men, wiped out uh, in some places almost a whole generation of, of young people doing what God wanted to do through the gospel. Change the hearts of men. Amen? I said change the hearts of men and change the hearts of women and, and bring them into the light of the gospel. Amen. Well, they used about, listen, there's a lot of people who use the Bible for the wrong thing. God gets through, to, gets through eventually. Amen.
All right, well, that went over big, but thank you anyway. I don't know that we needed, we should have, you know, I'm not saying that we should have had a war to get rid of slavery. God could have gotten rid of slavery. That went over even bigger. Giving him the time, preaching the truth, have a revival. Are you here? There's one person here. Anybody else here? Well, Paul didn't deal with the issue of slavery as saying it was wrong or right. He was saying, now he's coming back, make him a brother. He wasn't okaying slavery. He wasn't giving, uh, he wasn't uh, substantiating and giving a, uh, a, an okay to continue, as, continue working in slavery. He was just not dealing with that issue on that level. He was dealing with the change in the men's, hearts of men, and that eventually will change the culture. Yes. Hallelujah. And the same thing is going to have to happen in our country now. We're not, we're not going to change them. We cannot change racism with programs. You can't change it with political correctness. You can't change it by telling people that they got to accept this and they got to accept it. You're not going to change it through the government. Hello? You're not going to change it by running people out of office because they use a certain word. Hello? I mean, Listen. I mean, Creflo, you know, he has an adopted white son. I don't know if y'all know that or not. He's an adopted white son. He adopted him when he was younger. He's, he's, he's his son. He's white, but he's adopted. And he's out playing basketball with a bunch of other African Americans. And he's talking just like they are. And y'all know what I mean. Throw me the ball. Y'all know the next word. And he said, come over here. He said, you can't say that. Why not? You just can't say that. They saying it. You, but you can't say it. Why not? Because you're white. What's that got to do with it? They're saying it. He was, he was, he was raised around that. He's, he's talking just like everybody else. See, we, we get all whatever. We try to get cute and all this kind of stuff. When we should be changing the hearts of men and women. I mean, I, I, I'm Martin Luther King. He dreamed of the day when the white child and the black child could sit down together. They would judge a man not by the color of his skin, but the content of his character. But as long as we keep bringing it up and telling everybody that you know, this and that, and you can't, you, you, you know, uh, we got to, you know, embrace our color and all this kind of stuff, we're not going to get there. White people are trying to, you know, wanting to raise up and be white, and black people want to raise up and be black, and, you know, why don't we just raise up and be Christians? We're not a black church or a white church. Let's stop talking all that stupid mess. You know, white folks don't know how to worship God. Black people do this and black that. I mean, we got all, we got all these different things, and all we keep talking about is, and every time we do it, we're bringing a division. Let's talk about Jesus Christ. Amen? That that pastor of that church is a, is a part of the body of Christ. Doesn't matter what color it is, it's part of the body of Christ. Amen? We're, we're brothers one together in the work of, of the kingdom. That's how we're going to do it. When, when, the, when the church stops being the political uh, prostitute of the political parties, Amen. Amen. Being pimped by politicians for the votes. And we start walking in love one toward another and speaking what the word says. And don't give a rip what party has it as long as they're doing godly things. Yes. We'll get further down the road. But the church is being pimped and they're doing it because it gives them status. All right. We'll move right along because that, that one's got y'all thinking. I'm, I, I don't want to be pimped by anybody. I'm a representative of Jesus Christ. I'm not a representative of any political party. And pastors, that's what we need to be doing. <clears throat> Stop worrying about what party's going to give us what we want and doing what Jesus tells us to do. Now that y'all are all excited about that. Okay. Uh, verse 17, if thou count me therefore as a partner, receive him as myself. In other words, if you count me in that koinonia, in that fellowship, in that partnership of ministry, you receive an just as just like you would receive me. Now, I know he's a runaway slave. He stole from you. But I'm asking you, when he comes to you, you accept him just like it was me standing there in the flesh. If, if you count us as in fellowship, as in koinonia, fellowship, partnership together in the work of God, that this is what I'm asking you to do. He's not telling me he had to. He said, but if you count me that way, 
If our relationship is thus, receive him like you would receive me. Now, that's a bold statement. It was an authoritarian. It was asking. Amen? Um, if he's wrong thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. And so in other words, he said, look, hey, hey, if he owes you something, I'll pay you back. Don't, don't let what he owes you in the financial realm stop you from doing what I'm asking you to do. You know, I've heard people say, well, until they repent, I'm not going to forgive them. Well, you, you can just go the rest of your life in unforgiveness then. Because there are going to be some people who will never repent. There will be some people who will never say they were wrong. That's just the way it is. Amen. This is going to be, you know, now, can't expect them to say they're wrong if they're not wrong, but if they're all wrong, they, you know, and they won't, won't repent, they may not ever repent to you. I've, I've had people do stuff to me that they've never repented. Had some, it took them 15 years. Had some out of the blue get a phone call, say, hey, look, I did such and such, you know, and want you to forgive me. I'm like, that was 15 years ago, brother. I forgave you a long time ago. Yeah, but they needed to get it right. See, they had to get it straight. And so for their sake, they call. Well, sure, I'll forgive you. I already have, but just for the sake of this conversation, I forgive you. Amen. So that you can go on, you can go forward. Hallelujah. And here Paul says, you know, if he's done something wrong to you, if he, he owes you money, you put it on my account. And this is the next verse. I, Paul, in other words, Paul was dictating this. Paul usually dictated his letters and somebody else wrote them down. But here he says this. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. In other words, Paul, Paul probably, they, the uh, commentators think that my Paul may have actually reached over and took the scribe away from who was writing it down and wrote down himself. I write this in my own hand, I'll repay it. And then gave it back to him. He went on dictating. For emphasis sake. Albeit, listen to this. Albeit, now he's going to appeal to another side here. Albeit, I do not say to thee how that thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. In other words, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you you owe me your own life, but there it is, you know, just in case you forgot. You owe me your life. But I'm not going to say it. All right, enough said. He said it, didn't he? Hallelujah. Um, yea, brother. Again, he's, he's terms of endearment. Let my joy, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Let refresh my innermost being in the Lord by doing what I'm asking you to do. Having confidence in thy obedience as I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou will also do more than I say. You know what? Paul is, Paul is he's good. <laughs> he's really good here. Not only are you going to do what I ask you to do, you're going to do even more than I ask you. I know you will. But why does Paul know it? Because he knows Philemon's vertical love and faith in God has been demonstrated in his love and faith towards his fellow man. And Paul knows because of that fellowship he has with God, he will do, exact, he'll do what he asks him to do and even more than that because it's Christ working in him. Amen. He trusts the God of heaven that's in Philemon to cause him to do what is beyond right. It is the realm of love and restitution and forgiveness. And Paul says, I know you'll do even more than I ask you to do. Hallelujah. But with all, prepare me also a lodging. In other words, get, get a room ready for me. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. In other words, I, I'm going to get out of prison and come see you. Okay? So he says, look, I'm, I'm, I want to come. Get, get things ready for me. He has a relationship with this man. And it may be a tough on him to start with. Is, you know, he's talking about, but here's, here's my slave coming back. But Paul appealed to his spiritual side and to his walk with God and to the, the nature he knows is working in him. And, and Paul kind of concludes and says, look, I know you're going to do it. I know you're going to do it. I know you're going to do even more. Because what Paul, you know what Paul really wanted? He wanted Onesimus to serve him, to be his fellow companion where he was, to help him do what he needed to do as Paul the aged to finish his ministry. Hallelujah. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Um, Marcus, that's Mark, uh, Articus, Demas, Lucas, Luke, the physician, my fellow laborers, and then he concludes this, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So Paul finishes this up with, you know, so those different people saluting them, 
call it, you know, their names, you know, they, they, they're sending you the greetings. And then, once again, refers to the fact we need God's grace to be able to do what we do for God. Amen. amen? And thank God for his grace. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. Do you know we did a whole letter tonight? There's only 21 verses or 22 verses. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It was one chapter. I guess we just did one chapter. <laughs> just happened to be a whole letter. Can you say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.